Okay, Assalamualaikum and a very good day everyone. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have uh, separated uh, my final topic into two presentations. Uh, so here is my last presentation on quality assurance, quality control and accreditation. In this topic, we will discuss on quality assurance, uh, quality management, internal quality control uh, and external quality assurance. We will discuss a bit on the accreditation and also the accreditation process. Okay, here is the definition of quality assurance in Black Bank. Uh, it is a systematic monitoring and evaluation activity that involves uh, various aspects of lab, including lab process and methodology, uh, equipment, uh, reagents and consumable uh, products of lab, which refers to results and blood product to ensure that standards of quality are being met. So this pyramid uh, shows that quality assurance and quality control uh, falls under quality management. Um, quality management in blood transfusion service concerns every aspect of transfusion practice and it has to be applied uh, in all activities uh, of blood transfusion service. Uh, Quality management uh, starts uh, with selection of uh, blood donors, uh, adequate collection of blood, preparation of blood components, uh, quality lab testing, and finally, ensuring the safest and most appropriate use of blood and blood products. Uh, I have mentioned about quality assurance and also quality management. Now I am going to elaborate a bit about internal quality control. Uh, IQC is a set of procedures performed by the lab staff for continuously and also simultaneously assessing lab work uh, to decide whether they are reliable enough uh, to be released. Um, IQC allows a lab technician to check their own performance and help to monitor the reliability of the lab technique. Uh, because IQC is done daily, it maintains day-to-day uh, -day working objectively and detects any uh, deviation. External quality assurance or EQA is as important as internal QC in quality. EQA has other similar name which is known as proficiency testing. EQA is a process uh, or system that is designed to objectively assess the quality of lab results obtained by medical laboratories and this assessment is done by external body uh, okay uh, so the purpose of this uh, EQA is to assess the performance of the medical laboratory periodically and compare um, the lab performance with the peer group peer group uh, refers to the lab that use same methodology of the test it means that uh, the performance of your lab will be compared with other lab that use uh, the same method principle machine and reagent. In other words, uh, your lab cannot uh, short sediri lah, uh, with your own performance. Uh, medical laboratories uh, take part in an EQA program because this is a requirement for accredited laboratories uh, ISO 15189 2012. In clause 5.6.3, it has stated that inter-laboratory comparison is compulsory and lab shall participate in interlaboratory comparison program appropriate to the examination uh, and interpretation of uh, examination results. Uh, the lab uh, can join uh, EQA programs uh, that are available locally, uh, regionally and also internationally. There are numbers of factors that we need to consider when choosing an EQA program for blood bank. First, sample design and frequency. Some EQA programs are straightforward testing for specific work process. Uh, some are complex and difficult to resolve as this is what we had experienced so far. Some EQA program is offered as uh, frequent as six surveys uh, per year and some are less than that. Second, uh, what goal that we want to achieve from EQA program that we participate? Do we just want an objective report or report that helps us to identify the defects on the method that we are currently practicing? Third, since EQA sample is modified uh, biological material that mimic our patient sample, 
Therefore, it has limitation on certain platform or method. As a result, sample must be commutable and also traceable on our platform. Fourth, the EKA must be user-friendly and easy to understand. Fifth, uh, the result and report must be scientifically uh, valid and reliable. I mean in terms of statistical analysis. Six, the EQA report should also have value in education and not just a program of EQA. It should have discussion on advantages and disadvantages or method that we are currently practicing. Seven, EQA provider must provide strong support when problem arises, especially when there is a problem on a sample dispatch, reporting issue, submission issue, etc. Eight, the EQA provider must maintain confidentiality of the participant's report. Our performance shall not be notified to other participants without our consent. Nine, EQA program shall have good track record and consistent as we have experienced receiving offers from new EQA providers that, that the consistency is um, questionable. Finally, cost factor. Of course, you need to ensure that the cost that you are investing for the lab for inter-laboratory comparison is worth of your workload. Sometimes the price of EQA program keeps increasing year to year due to currency uh, exchange. So far, uh, I have mentioned about IQC and EQA which are part of quality management. Um, so here is the summary of comparison between IQC and EQA in blood bank. First, IQC and EQA cover tests that are related to donor selection, collected blood products, serological tests, equipment, and work process. Usually, serological or infectious disease screening is uh, tested under microbiology and not directly under blood bank. For IQC, there is an additional test that covers the performance of the reagent that we use daily. The performance of reagent includes uh, tests on appearance, reactivity, specificity, and potency. On the contrary, EQA offers uh, tests that are related to pre- and post-transfusion testing. While material uh, for IQC is uh, either available commercially and in-house, uh, sample material for EQA is provided by EQA provider. Reagents that are used in daily lab work are also part of internal QC material. Um, IQC's uh, results are known immediately, which we have a range of expected results that we should uh, attain. If not, this means our materials or reagents for IQC testing fail to work. On the other hand, EQA results are unknown until the report is out. In terms of frequency, IQC is done daily, but reagents and performance are done for every batch. Uh, on the contrary, the EQA is uh, done uh, periodically, and this depends on EQA program that we participate. The reporting format uh, for IQC is made uh, objectively, and it is easier to monitor the performance. Um, the format is designed by the respective lab uh, in compliance with a specific technical requirement for blood bank. EQA format uh, depends on EQA program and it is always fixed and it depends on us on how to appreciate the reporting format. For IQC, comparison is made within the lab only, but EQA will assist us will assist us to compare our performance with other lab that use the same method with us. In return, we are able to know whether our method and operator are performing as good as others. Here is the list of EQA programs for medical testing. The first one is Royal College Pathologists Australasia, RCPA, the EQA program from Australia. The second one is our local EQA program, uh, Quality Assurance Program Transfusion, QAPTX, organized by Malaysian Blood Transfusion Society. The third one is from the UK, National External Quality Assessment Service, NICAS, and the last one, uh, the EQA program from the US, College of American Pathologists Proficiency Testing, 
external quality assurance. These four programs uh, offer scope for blood transfusion service. Uh, since I am familiar with RCPA and QAPTX, I will uh, elaborate further in my uh, next slide. In general, these are the stages involved in EQA process. Uh, first one is dispatching EQA material by EQA provider. Uh, the second stage is analytical process and result submission by EQA participant. Uh, the third stage is data analysis and report release by EQA provider. And finally, uh, report analysis and corrective preventive action by EQA participant. As you can see here, uh, these are scope of tests offered by EQA provider for hospital-based transfusion. This is an example of scope of tests uh, from RCPA EQA program. The pictures uh, show how do the EQA sample look like. On your left are uh, EQA samples from QAPTX. Uh, the right picture represents uh, EQA samples from uh, RCPA. Did you notice about the labeling and the bottles? Uh, our local EQA program utilized the commercially prepared EQA samples but the RCPA samples are manufactured and labeled exactly like our patient sample. The QAPTX uh, samples remain unchanged from survey to survey in which uh, two patient samples that need to be cross-matched with two donors' blood. But EQA samples uh, vary from survey to survey according to type of case. This is the form that the participant needs to fill up when testing EQA sample for QAPTX. As I mentioned just now, there are two donor samples that need to be tested for blood grouping. And then, a pre-transfusion testing needs to be done for patient A followed by cross-matching with two previous donors. Similarly, the same pre-transfusion testing is performed for patient B followed by cross-matching with the same donors. So far, the same case design hasn't changed for uh, QAPTX. Um, I fish out this official QAPTX report uh, from our past survey. I just want to show here that uh, QAPTX is a straightforward report, no discussion, but it displays uh, the participant result in comparison with uh, target result. Penalty will be given if result is out. Um, the first page uh, shows ABO grouping result for two donor samples. Uh, the second page uh, shows pre-transfusion testing results uh, for patient A followed by patient B in uh, page 3. Results are objective type which include ABO grouping, antibody screening, uh, direct combs test uh, if applicable and cross-matching with the same respective donors. Uh, there is an additional of antibody identification result uh, for labs that include uh, this uh, scope of uh, testing. On the other hand, this is an example of result template for RCPA EQA testing. As you can see here, the form looks quite complicated with empty boxes to be filled up. It includes scope of tests for pre-transfusion testing such as a patient identification, ABO and RH grouping, uh, antibody screening, antibody identification, donor phenotyping, blood donors ABO grouping, compatibility testing with donor samples and decision making whether to transfuse or not to transfuse. This is uh, another result template for RCPA. Every year, RCPA challenge participants with different type of case. Uh, this one is a phytomethanol case in which that uh, two patient samples uh, consisting of mother and baby samples. The case requires a participant to perform blood grouping for mother and then uh, for the baby, followed by DCT test for the baby. If DCT test is positive, uh, participant is required to perform baby illusion uh, studies and proceed to antibody identification if indicated. At the same time, uh, mother is screened for antibody screening and proceed to antibody identification if indicated. Uh, donor unit phenotyping and donor blood grouping are then performed. Uh, finally, the participant uh, must perform cross-matching tests for mother with the donor samples given and record the decision whether to transfuse or not. 
all of this report, uh, all of these uh, results uh, must be submitted online. This is how the RCPA survey report looks like. The report must have the name of the AQA program, uh, identification of the survey, uh, the due date, and must also have the participant number. When we turn to the next page, uh, the RCPA will explain a bit about the scoring system, uh, which uh, section carries mark the most and the least, uh, performance level uh, categories, and overall uh, performance assessment score for the participant. The interesting part of RCPA report is about on how they present the report. First, the identification of the patient. Participant must enter the patient identification correctly in order to obtain full mark. Uh, participant's methodology is also displayed together with the scores of the reaction. Uh, therefore, as a participant, we will be able to know whether our results are comparable with other participants or not. In the next page, uh, similarly, participants' uh, methodology uh, together with the reaction scores are shown accordingly. Uh, participants and target results are displayed uh, as well. In this page, uh, RCPA consistently shows participant uh, methodology. Then, uh, the reaction scores for blood grouping for each donor are displayed in detail. At one corner of this report, the overall uh, donor grouping scores is shown here. Uh, as expected, uh, participants' uh, methodology is displayed uh, in this page. And then, a uh, compatibility reaction for patient sample with donor samples are given scores and marks are also given for a decision whether to transfuse or not. At the, at the bottom here, uh, RCPA will put uh, a lengthy comment on the results. Uh, RCPA will discuss in detail on results obtained by participants. How many participants are losing a point on certain part of the survey and as participants we will know how good or bad are we performing. This is important as we need to know whether the method that we use in the lab is acceptable uh, and whether our operator is performing the right thing or not. At the end of the report, the participant can figure out their position among other participants. At one corner of this report, a participant score for each survey will be written here and in a glance, uh, participants will be able to compare their performance in that year, whether becoming better or worse. These lengthy comments are supplementary notes in which the RCPA discuss in detail about the case survey. Uh, problems and failures um, among the participants were explained. Uh, advice were given for participants who were having problem getting acceptable results. At this point, uh, as participants, we will be able to know uh, advantages and limitation of method that we are currently practicing. Therefore, this is part of a uh, scientific discussion that the participants uh, would gain. Uh, now, finally, we will discuss a bit on lab accreditation. Uh, back in history in 1987, lab accreditation based on ISO IEC 17025 was introduced. Uh, this was followed by the introduction of a national unified uh, lab accreditation scheme known as Scheme Accreditasi Magma Malaysia SAMM in 1990. Uh, six years later, uh, Department of Standard Malaysia was established under the Standard of Malaysia Act 1996. Uh, therefore, all accreditation activities in Malaysia will come directly under Standards Malaysia. Uh, assessment criteria for lab accreditation will be based on this document uh, as published in MS ISO IEC 17025, uh, MS, MS ISO 15189, uh, SAMM policies, uh, specific criteria and specific technical requirements. Uh, an accredited lab is actually a lab that meets uh, both the technical competence and the management system requirements essential in delivering uh, technically valid results uh, consistently. Uh, competent, qualified and trained personnel approve and documented protocols and procedure 
are needed for lab accreditation. Um, accreditation process starts with preparation and self-examination. At this stage, the quality team is set up and then personnel that will anchor the quality process is appointed. Scopes of tests are identified, lab op standard operating procedures documents are prepared and quality workshops to all staff are organized uh, from time to time to ensure all staff understand the management's objectives. Uh, then the quality team will start the application uh, process to Standard Malaysia and pay the application fee. Uh, Standard Malaysia will evaluate the application and grant the application. Uh, Standard Malaysia will pay a visit and perform assessment and examination. After that, list of non-compliance are given to applicant. Applicant then submit corrective action and preventive actions to Standard Malaysia. Uh, judgment of action is evaluated by Standard Malaysia. Accreditation award is granted for three years after the accredited organization has satisfied with the process, documents and action. And finally, continuous reviews are performed during surveillance assessment within 12 months. Reassessment is done before certificate expires. The impact of accreditation can be seen among a few stakeholders. Uh, first of all, the public. Uh, accreditation will reduce the risk for business and customers because uh, public confidence and satisfaction are guaranteed. Uh, second, the government. Government is able to ensure the quality of the lab operated in the country are at a high standard. Lab accreditation allows uh, data to be eligible for future use and helps in health decision making for the country. This in turn uh, reduces uncertainties and eventually protect human and environment. Third, lab staff. The accreditation will make the staff to be aware and confident. Also, they will feel proud as they feel they are part of the process. This will create an uh, effective working uh, environment. And finally, management. The management will have clear delegation of responsibility and authorities. Um, a systematic workflow and good monitoring are taken place. This will reduce uh, cost of correcting work process of the accredited lab. Okay, uh, that is the end of my lecture. I hope you all can gain uh, benefit through my series of lectures. All the best for your course. Uh, as usual, drop me an email if you have any burning questions. Thank you very much.